stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never fail. It promised is Great is your you. We'll never forget your promises, God. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let's continue with our online service. everyone. What a blessing to be able to share this time together with all of you. Like I say, my friends, near and far, wherever you are, some of you part of our Cornerstone Church community online, some of you maybe even joining us for the very first time. And if that's you, I'm Pastor Terry, lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco. Thanks for joining us. You know, I'm just going to ask God's blessing over this time. I'm praying that the Lord would speak to all of us. And even now, Lord, Jesus, we just welcome your presence in. We welcome your goodness, your life, wisdom, understanding. Help us to grow in healthy love together. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Yeah, our series is Healthy Love. And today I want to talk about what to do when we've been hurt. How love can surrender to grace. We're going to look at this together. Have you ever been hurt? Talked down to? Disrespected? Treated? unjustly or taken advantage of? I mean, that was a rhetorical question, by the way, because <laughs> I know what the answer is. All of us have at some point been hurt. And well, what comes out of us when that happens? That's what I want to explore. You know, some of us, I was thinking that we all react, respond in different ways when we're hurt. Some of us are, if I can put this into categories, retaliators. That is, we strike back. You hurt me, I strike back. Shoot first, <laughs> aim second. And that's how we can get into trouble. Others, others of us, we're not retaliators. We're more like avoiders <laughs> or excuse makers. We are so disinclined to conflict that we allow things to pass that we should probably address. Any of us? avoiders here. Still others of us are passive aggressors. We, we retaliate, uh, but in less obvious ways. We don't immediately react, nor do we excuse, uh, you know, just let it go. We're not avoiding necessarily, uh, but we're more likely to nurture our offense internally as we fume on the inside and we waste tons of time, precious time, that life is composed of on this side of eternity. Just thinking about <laughs> something we should have said, should have done. In fact, those of us who are passive aggressive types, we may even be quick to assume offense, but the initial reaction is to stuff it down and uh, well, that's just corruptive for our soul and it's relationally toxic. What's more, passive aggressors are prone to every now and then explosions 
and volcanic reactions. And then lastly, some of us, we're not retaliators, you know, we're not avoiders, we're not passive aggressors, but we're, if I can use this term, calculators. We are calculating in vengeance. We are waiting for the opportunity to repay the perpetrator. At the right time, we will strike. It's just a matter of when. But our anger is real. It's real. And yet the Lord reminds us that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right? And according to the scripture, we are to seek justice, um, but not to do it in a way that is, is wrong. You know, to, to desire justice is a good thing. But to act vengefully, unfortunately, if I can say it this way, is out of harmony with the love of Christ and it ends up hurting and doing a whole lot of damage, far more than we know. So with that in mind, serving kind of as the backdrop, I want to explore how Christian love responds when it is wronged. I want to talk about how healthy love, the Jesus love, the Jesus way surrenders, teaches us how to surrender to grace. And again, it's not that love turns a blind eye or lives in denial. No, love does not live in denial. It doesn't. Or pretend something is good when it is not. So that's not what we're being asked to do here. But neither does it want to live in bondage to the wrong. To be captured by it. To be defined by it. uh, To be defeated by it. Like it's a double defeat. So though we're not to deny our wounds, we don't want to be defined by them. Did you hear me say that? Though we are not to deny our wounds and hurts, we are not to be defined by them. Love, oh, as much as possible, the love of Christ is to be our freedom song. Let's go back. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. I'm going to just read these first few verses from the ESV translation. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body, do be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. And here's the word we're going to sit with or resentful. And an even older, less used translation, the Weymouth New Testament, I think really illuminates what we're wanting to uh, get to here. It goes like this. If I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I'm destitute of love, I've become a loud sounding trumpet or a clanging cymbal. If I possess the gift of prophecy and am versed in all mysteries and all knowledge and have such absolute faith that I can remove mountains. We've talked about all these things, by the way, but I'm destitute of love. I am nothing. If I distribute all my possessions to the poor and give my body up to be burned, that's high level, but I'm destitute of love. It profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love neither, knows neither envy nor jealousy. Love is not forward or self-assertive nor boastful and conceited. Look at this. She does not behave unbecomingly nor seek to aggrandize herself nor blaze out in passionate anger. But here's the phrase. Here it is. Here it is. Nor brood over wrongs. Right? This is really good. She does not behave unbecomingly nor seek to aggrandize herself, that is, to self-enhance or self-glorify, nor blaze out in passionate anger. That is, love isn't reckless and reactive. But this phrase, nor brood over wrongs, I mean, I think this hits the mark with power and with force. Brood over wrongs. What are we going to brood upon? Because what we brood upon will define us. It will. It really will. I I had a professor in seminary who, and thank you, Dr. Pinkham, who said, Terry, what you won't let be, won't let you be. And when when we try to control what we can't control, what we can't control will control us. I'm going to say that one more time. When we try to control what we can't control, what we can't control will control us. Think about that. 
Jude, the New Testament letter right before the book of Revelation. It's one of the shortest books in all the Bible. It's only one chapter. The only two shorter uh, books are the two epistles that immediately precede it, 2nd and 3rd John. You want to give someone uh, <laughs> a hard time say, let's turn to Jude, the second chapter, verse 3. <laughs> There is no Jew too. It's just one chapter. In the middle of the chapter, though, there is this reference to three examples of foolishness and willful, destructive disobedience. Three ways that we are not to go. And I want to connect this to what we're exploring here about love and what love doesn't do and how we can overcome our hurts and how we can learn to live in grace. I want to look at some examples of what not to do from Jude. And it says this, woe to them. For they walk in the way of Cain, which we're going to look at in a moment. And they've abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's uh, error, error. You know, Balaam was a man seduced by the love of money to the extent that he was willing to use his gift to hurt God's people. Think about that. And perished in Korah's rebellion. Korah was a man who overstepped his authority and led a rebellion against Moses. And God's anointed. And you can read about all three of these, Cain, Balaam, and Korah in the Old Testament. But it's the first one that I want us to sit with as we consider the nature of healthy love and what happens when, when love becomes unhealthy. So you know, check this out. Uh, the second to the last book of the Bible, think of it this way, takes us all the way back to the, well, the beginning of the first book of the Bible. Genesis, the beginning of recorded human history. In this classic example of Cain, we understand that he nurtured his grievance in a very unhealthy, unloving way. He allowed his pain, his hurt, his offense, his jealousy, his envy to overcome him, and it infected him. And in his anger, we're told that he slew his brother. In fact, I want to read this, revisit it. It's from Genesis 4. Look what it says. Look how it describes this. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother, Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. So Abel was a shepherd. Cain was a farmer. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. They were taught early to worship and honor God with their first fruits. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and the, their fat portions, which by the way, it shows us that giving and yielding the, our first fruits in offering is something that is embedded actually even before Abraham and Moses. It goes all the way back to the beginning. It says, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. That is, he didn't receive it. And so Cain was very angry and his face fell. You know, when we're angry, when we're upset, when we're uh, brooding in, in some type of, a, of, a, of an offense or we're offended, uh, it shows up in our demeanor, doesn't it? People can sometimes say, especially when they're close to us, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? <laughs> Because we wear it. It says his face fell. What a way to describe it. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? What's wrong with you? Listen, if you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, if you offer what I've asked you in the way that I've asked you, <laughs> I'll accept it. There's no favors here. And if you do not do well, listen, sin is crouching at the door. Whoa, whoa. And his desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Mm, mm, that's a word for many of us right there. And Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. They must have started talking. He hadn't resolved his anger. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. It was the first recorded murder in the history of the human race. <laughs> the beginning of the ceaseless spilling of blood that has characterized humanity for generations. 
the God of love is very much aware of this. In fact, when he sent his only son, our world spilled his blood too. Right? What's wrong with human beings? What's inside of a human being? There's so much good. There's so much that isn't good. It says, and the Lord said, well, then the Lord said, Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I did not know. I, am I my brother's keeper? Whoa. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. <laughs> but he basically said, I'm not responsible for him. Who am I? Like, that's it. How, why do I, how would I know? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. His life speaks even as you've taken it from him. What, a, what language the Bible uses here. And so what we see here is how Cain shows us, listen, how destructive it can be. This is the connection. How destructive it can be to brood over offense. Love's evidence and love's wisdom when we're hurt we're bothered, irritated. We feel demeaned, disrespected, treated poorly. The love's wisdom is to surrender to grace as well. And remember, grace is it's always more than what is not done. Grace is always more than what is not done. Mercy is the withholding of judgment and wrath. But grace is one step further. It not only withholds, it substitutes something more. Well, it builds on the withholding and adds a blessing. That's grace. And when we are walking and surrendering to grace, which is how the Lord wants us to live, uh, what's going to happen is uh, we're going to end up being much better and much happier and much more able, equipped to overcome the inevitable uh, disappointments and offenses of life. What we're talking at least in part about as well is the power of a positive focus and gratitude as compared to the rumination on wrong and hurt. Like we're going to have to focus on something in this life. And instead of focusing on what others do to us that we are upset about, we are far better off focusing on uh, not only the blessings that God has placed all around us and the, and the many, many blessings that the, are available to us through all the people who do good to us, but also on the goodness of God at work in our own hearts and lives. And so we get to decide where's our focus going to be but I want to come back here. What, I, what I'm talking about then, and this is really important, is that the goal is not just not to brood over the negative. Like love doesn't brood over wrong. It, it, see, the, that's not the goal. The goal of healthy love is just not not to do the negative, but to do the positive, that is to focus, to fill our thoughts with the good and the positive. Do you see how much that can be a blessing for all of us? To think on these things, to use the language of the New Testament scriptures in Philippians 4, right? We're reminded to think on these things, to focus on the good. So, loved ones, we're not, <laughs> we're not to pretend what happened didn't happen, uh, but rather to, to commit all things in the Father's hands, right? And to embrace promise and choose to live in the freedom of Christ for whom the Son has set free, we're told, is, is free indeed. As a practice of life, we, sh we, are, we are not to focus on the wrong, but on the good done. Focus on the good, not on the wrong. And listen, the ultimate good that was done for us was, was Jesus on the cross. For God so loved this world that he gave us his only begotten son, right? That this idea of embracing grace as the older generations often concluded meant 
staying near the cross. Like it was one of the keys because that is the ultimate good. The ultimate good was that God would give everything for us so that we might have everything through him. That's good. And that's the bedrock of our identity and faith. And it's to be the defining aspect of our life. You know, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Keep me focused on the right things. Remind me of your love. So embracing grace does that. It, it, it allows for the cross to become the meta narrative of our life. If I can put it that way. Like it's the overarching story that defines us. The goodness of God on full display, the love of Christ at work for you and me at a very personal level. God is love. He gives everything. He gives us his son. And then Jesus, the son gives us his life that we might have life that we could never earn on our own and his presence and a promise of what is yet to come so much that we didn't deserve. That's called grace. That's the Lord's love. And sometimes that love will meet us at the place of our most deepest wounds and the hardest hurts that we're trying to push past. So, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, we think about Jesus and staying near to the cross. We're talking about a love gift that we did not deserve and could never earn and making it our overarching foundational story. And this is like the old hymn says, this is my story, right? This is my song. What is it? Praising my savior all the day long. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. You know, when we do this, we can negotiate the hurts and wounds of life. And instead of being overcome by them, like, like what happened with Cain, we can overcome them in Jesus name by the power of his love. Another way, it's, another way of saying this is that there are some hurts and some wounds we cannot erase, right? We can't erase them. I can't, I, I, I wish I could. I, I wish I could some, in some areas of my life, I wish I could in some things that are some hurt I've, I've done. I wish I could for you. I wish I could just erase them. But it doesn't always work that way. You know, we can't make ourselves forget. In fact, we know that sometimes when, we're, when we repress things, they tend to possess us in a different way. So the solution, stay with me. Stay, stay with me here. The solution to overcoming the hurts and wounds we cannot erase is to envelop them with his grace. I'll say that one more time for you, loved one, loved son, loved daughter, the one who is the object of his affection. That's you. Remember this. And that's me too. Thank you, Lord, that we can never overcome the hurts and wounds of life um, by trying to erase them. We just need to allow the Lord's grace to envelop them. We need to let them be enveloped with his grace. Don't erase, envelop with his grace. That's, that's what happens when God can turn even the worst into some good, some good. It doesn't mean it ever will be good, but he can bring good from things. And there are good things that can grow out of it, even when it wasn't what we wanted nor ideal. So Jesus teaches us something, doesn't he? Here it is. Stay close to his words. Why? Because they are spirit and they are life. And we need to brood upon his love. And I mentioned the cross, but brood upon his love, especially that is linger with it, sit with it. Let it, let it start to define us and, and soothe us and uh, overwhelm us as it were. Like let it defeat. It, it is capable. It's the ultimate immune system. It's a spiritual immunity is the love of Christ at work in our lives. Any attacking virus will be defeated by the love of Christ at work in us. What can separate us from any, and nothing can separate us from his love. If we want to stay in it, it can help us overcome everything. But I think it's so important to root upon his love. And especially when we feel the grip of evil and anger trying to consume us into a sinful and 
and, and destructive uh, retaliatory place, uh, retaliatory place, or you know, when we want to do something back to that person to hurt them, uh, say evil words, say bad words, painful words, death dealing words. It's not God's will for us not to do it. No, no, Lord, please forgive us when we do that. That was not your way. And then sometimes to also prevent us from doing self-harm because sometimes our reaction is to embrace that definition and to embrace that wound in such a way that we start to demean ourselves as someone lovable. And that's also not God's plan for our lives, is it? It can't be, ever. No. You are so loved. You are so deeply loved. And nothing can change that. These are the things that the Lord has for us were purchased with the most beautiful thing he could give, which is his own life. And he couldn't give us anything more than that to secure his love to work in our lives. He doesn't want us to be captured by our anger. He doesn't want us to be captured by our wounds. He doesn't want us to be captured by our hurt. He wants us to be captured by his grace. And he's going to say, well, that's idealistic, right? That's not realistic, right? How do you live like that? You've got to protect yourself. You know, we've got to defend ourselves. I get that. It's true. To some degree, there are times where we do need to be wise and we need to protect. And, and there may be times when we do need to defend. I mean, Jesus did talk about, yeah, turn the other cheek. But he also talked about protecting the house when you know the thief is going to break in and steal. Um, there's a wisdom in living well. And God never calls us to be a doormat, uh, to, to live codependently or to live dysfunctionally. Uh, he doesn't want us to be defined by the negativity and just keep it inside of us. Some of us, like I said, at the very beginning, right, we talked about this. Some of us, we are quick to retaliate. God doesn't want us to do that. He doesn't want us to just fly off the handle, right? That's not what healthy love does. It, but he doesn't want us also just to accommodate and like we were talking about um, earlier, you know, this idea of avoiding uh, making excuse, not dealing with the reality of our situation when it's there and to pretend something isn't wrong or abusive uh, when it is, that's not loving either. And some of us have to work on that. We really do. Some of us has to work on our reactive tendencies. And that's when we do a lot of our worst work. If I can say it that way, like I, like we say things, we say things. Some of us might break things. That's not good at all. But our words can break. Our words can define. Our words can have a lasting effect. And it's hard to take them back once they get out of us. So let's watch this retaliation. And then let's also make sure that we're not avoiding. We talked about that as well. And healthy love doesn't doesn't close his eyes to things and just say, oh, there's no problem here. There's no problem here. Well, it's just all, there, there might be, there, if there is one, love wants to address and we're going to talk about that more in the weeks to come as well. And then, like I mentioned, others of us are more passive aggressive. There's no virtue in being passive aggressive. <laughs> there isn't. I know some people, they never confront or if they do, it, it comes out like an explosion out of, left, out of left field. No one knows what's going on. What happened? Because it was just being pushed in, 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 in. Other times, it's just this uh, subtle thing. Uh, and it's being nurtured inside of our heart. And we're offended. And it shows up in, in non-cooperation or... Uh, subtle words said, uh, that kind of passive aggressiveness, that is also not what healthy love does. And God doesn't want us to do that. So we may say, well, I don't react. And I'm not turning a blind eye. I'm just in my own way, retaliating, right? It's just a different kind of retaliation. That's not loving. Don't do it. Lord, help us. And of course, the calculators among us don't, you know, like, I'm just waiting my time. Like the Count of Monte Cristo. 
<laughs> it's like, I'm going to get you. I'm going to pay you back. I smile on my face. That's hypocrisy. Don't do that either. Well, I can't, pret- I, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to show my cards. So don't show your cards. All right. Just show your card. <laughs> Let's show our cards to Jesus. He sees them anyway. Say, oh, that's my hand. Yeah. He knows our hand. He wants us to be his hands, his feet, right? It's not, not our own uh, ways of dealing with hurt and in our anger and our offense. Lord, Lord, you know this. So as we move towards the end of our time together, we've got this song to share. And I also just want to remind all of you. Yeah, I get to do this because I was talking about first fruits earlier. How in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning of the Bible, there's this idea of bringing offering unto the Lord. I would be remiss if I didn't use it as an opportunity to remind all of you about honoring him with your tithes and your offerings to bring your first fruits. For me, it's my tenth. I tithe. I've been doing it since I was a boy. And then also this idea of offering, uh, which I bring to him in a spirit of gratitude and worship. May you do the same. May you actually consider what it is that you're honoring the Lord with and what it means to give our life in exchange for resource. If you're just with us for the first time and, and, or you're new here, I'm not trying to pressure any of you into giving. I just, but I do want to talk to our online community and those of you who claim to follow Jesus like I do. We share a common love for the Lord. Let's honor him and, and let's give. So this, the church that we are all a part of may, may prosper in the calling that we've been given and the stewardship that we've been honored with. So uh, with that in mind, I'll remind you then you can give a, a couple of different ways. You can send it into our offices. Some of you still do that. It's fine. You can give online it's directly through our site or you can give through our app. Download that Cornerstone SF app. That, uh, that's what I do. I give that way. But in, like I say, always first give him your heart. So Lord, as we prepare to share this song together and I'm going to come back around and give a final blessing, I just ask that you would allow some of what we've just been able to interact with around and, and the voice, your voice that we've hopefully listened for to just make things uh, clear for us. If there's something you really want to remind us of, help us to hear it. Even as we share this song and worship together, we just say, Lord, we're open. We're open. We want to be captured, not by offense, not by hurt. We want to be captured by your love. That's our prayer in Jesus name. to the broken shame. 
Love is now. Love is pouring from his hands, from his brow. Love is All right. <laughs> you know, sometimes, I was thinking about this, sometimes our, our negative thinking, our record keeping, our brooding over wrong things is more about ourselves than it is about being directed to other people. What I'm saying is sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Like we can't let it go. Healthy love definitely shows up by not being captured by offense and hurt as much as possible, not being defined by what others have done to us, said to us, the way they treated us, what they didn't do, what they should have done. But it also applies to ourselves and how we're treating ourselves, how sometimes we're not letting ourselves live in His grace. We're, we're record keeping on ourselves and we just feel like we're unworthy and, and we're never going to get it right and we don't deserve to get it right. And we don't deserve to be loved. And, but remember, grace is not about what is deserved. It's, when I surrender to His grace, I'm saying, Lord, I surrender to your undeserved gift, your love that I can never earn. I mean, I'm just open. I'm aware of my flaws. But I accept your grace, the embrace of your grace into my life. May you be filled with His love and embraced by His grace, all of you, in Jesus' name.